Hello everyone, welcome to today's gardening webinar series, Growing Citrus on Your Patio and Landscape. My name is David Rodriguez, horticulturalist with the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service in Bear County, San Antonio, Texas. There's my email address, so if you need any help with gardening or landscape, don't hesitate to send me an email. The extension service is over 104 years old in our great state of Texas with the educational arm of the oldest institute of higher education public institute in Texas, Texas A&M University. We are funded separately from the university with unique partnership in the 254 counties in our great state of Texas. So again, welcome to our gardening series on growing citrus on your patio and landscape. That's a picture of me there at our beautiful uh, children's vegetable garden program at the Botanical Garden. And our topic today is citrus. Well, we know that citrus is so wonderful, the vitamin C and all the energy we get from eating uh, citrus and the benefits. And it's a fun, fun crop for us to grow both on the patio and if you get the right tree in the proper place in your landscape as well. So we're gonna cover a few uh, species of citrus that you might have fun growing and some of the do's and don'ts of successfully growing citrus on your patio and in your landscape. So a little bit about citrus. When you think about citrus and other fruit tree types, the majority of trees that you buy at the nursery or garden center are grafted trees. So basically they use a root stock for your climate, for the type of soils that you're growing in, and they put a top portion on that root stock of a superior variety to have success. Citrus is uniquely different that you can truly start a citrus tree from seed that is going to be very, very similar to almost identical to mama tree. So any other fruit that you extract a seed from, it takes many, many years to get through the juvenility phase in order for it to go into production. And this the gene line is very, what we refer to as heterozygous, meaning that it's not true as mother. So. That's why fruit trees are grafted, pecans and things like that are grafted. So we bypass juvenility to get into production early and be the clone of the type that was grafted. But citrus is uniquely different, but again, it still should be grafted if we're trying to get into production early. So it's a long process of grafting citrus and other fruit trees. They graft citrus typically on rootstock, West of Houston is typically sour orange rootstock. Houston and East, they use typically trifoliata rootstock um, for the climate and soil, typically. And the grafting procedure on citrus is a bud patch. And they usually do an inverted, what they call an inverted T bud patch, which is the bottom middle uh, slide uh, that you see there. So this gives us a better understanding and the labor and skill level of not only grafting citrus trees, but fruit trees in general. More information on grafting citrus and other fruit trees, if you go to our Aggie Horticulture and PlantAnswers.com websites, uh, just uh, look up on the search engine under grafting, propagation, and it'll give you more in-depth information and the procedures. Normally we do this from April to early June when what we call the bark is uh, slipping and you are using very sharp uh, special, specialized budding knives for this process. So that's what we have, that's the end product. This is the type of tree, citrus tree that you would buy uh, from your nursery. They usually graft them up high on single trunk trees nowadays because of the stooping and the labor that's involved. So they can graft them at six inches at the soil line, above the soil line on that main stem. And some trees are even grafted up to 18 or 24 inches high. 
so they're not stooping uh, down that much. There's two major growers of containerized citrus in our great state of Texas. The biggest one that supplies most of the box stores and the great independent nurseries locally and throughout the state is north of Beaumont in Orange County, and they have a huge growing operation as well in Louisiana called Saxon Becknell and Sons. And this is the standard size. It's typically a 10 inch diameter container, what we call a number five or a deep five container, or some people still refer to them as five gallon uh, containers. Um, citrus grows as a big bush, but when they graft them, uh, they use single trunk techniques. So when we plant them on the patio or a, uh, in the landscape, and we'll talk about that, uh, we still grow it as a single trunk then off that single trunk then we grow it as a big big bush so down the line all citrus should be grown as a big bush thereafter so since we have so much deep deep history of citrus in the san antonio area particularly from our san antonio botanical garden let's talk about one of my favorite citrus and really has done significantly for the economics of the state as a million dollar uh, tree for the landscape is the Satsuma Mandarin Orange, or I like to call Christmas oranges because the best quality of fruit come in during the Christmas season. And if we remember, uh, that used to be a, a nice stocking stuffer for nice Christmas oranges. They, they are not true oranges. So Satsuma is one of the southernmost provident, province of Japan, the gateway into China, and Mandarin is a, a, a area in China. So we give them both appropriate because we're not really sure who originated the citrus, Satsuma Mandarin oranges, or I like to call Christmas oranges. So we, have a, we had a fellow many years ago, great man, one of the best plant breeders in my opinion, up there with Luther Burbank and others was Dr. Moy. And please read up on Dr. Moy. Uh, he was a well-renowned young uh, professor, scientist, plant breeder in China uh, who lived during the attack of the Japanese during World War II and left China uh, right around 1949 when the Chinese communists took over and his struggles and stories from both World War II and coming into the United States is a, a wonderful story. So if you go to plantanswers.com and look up Dr. Moy, uh, Paul Cox, who used to be the botanist at the San Antonio Botanical Garden, put a real nice uh, write-up on Dr. Moy, as well as a nice, at the end of the write-up, um, a book of about 132 plants that Dr. Moy hybridized and bred at the San Antonio Botanical Garden besides citrus, he did a lot of work on ginger, a lot of work on papayas, uh, roses, and other crops. So uh, very lucky to know this man, and he, he did great wonders and a great plant breeder as well, Dr. Moy. So to the left of Dr. Moy is Dr. Jerry Parsons. Dr. Jerry Parsons is the founder of the Texas Superstar Plant Program, and he also oversees uh, as his website plantanswers.com, which is many, many years of archived information throughout his horticulture uh, career. So uh, one time uh, back in the 80s, early to mid 80s, uh, Dr. Parsons was getting to know Dr. Moy, or he liked to be called Mr. Moy, at the San Antonio Botanical Garden. And uh, he was finding out that he, he coming from China, you know, ornamentals, are good and he liked to play with ornamentals and came about with the Moy Grande hibiscus, which was a big, big hardy perennial hibiscus with the Texas Superstar program, but also uh, being in China, uh, breeding plants for food because they have so many people in China. So they started uh, with the USDA uh, from Japan, bringing in seeds uh, with these uh, Satsuma Mandarin oranges and doing a lot, a lot of research and planting of these seeds 
uh, not only at the San Antonio Botanical Garden, but at our research center west of San Antonio in Uvalde. The start at the Setsuma Mandarin Orange uh, program uh, and selecting uh, through, uh, through the best of the best, working with growers and making it a million dollar, multi-million dollar effort uh, growing this citrus throughout the state for patio and in the landscape. So that's uh, where the first fruit trees uh, that were added to the Texas Superstar plant program because most plants of the Texas Superstar plant program are basically hardy summer color perennial type plants. A few shade trees, a few annuals, a, a few vegetables, but mainly perennials. So after doing much work and selecting and finding the best of the best of all these selections of many, many years, how to propagate them, how to grow them, how to get them in the production system, market them and all that, the two that were, were mentioned were both Miho and Sito. Now, all Setsuma Mandarin oranges that you buy or, or that are available are good. But without a doubt, Miho and Sito were really the best of the best when it came to quality fruit, consistent fruit year in and year out, the sugar content in that fruit, the overall vigor of the tree, and the ease of propagation and success for the grower to grow them and get them out to our Texas market. So a couple of traits of Satsuma mandarin oranges, particularly with Miho and Sito, is uh, wonderful on the patio and it does well in the landscape. And we'll give you some pointers of when and how to plant them in the landscape. But Satsuma mandarin oranges have a real thick rind. What we refer to as the Hesperidium, the, the easy to peel, very thick very few to no seeds in them. So if you get a couple of little ones, maybe five-year-old boys, and you give one a navel orange, um, he's gonna get very frustrated because he's unable to peel it because it's very, very leathery, very rough. If you give the other young fella, one of these Miho Sito or another Satsuma Mandarin orange, having thick flesh, quite easy for him to peel. Then you get a couple little baby babies and you give one uh, a navel orange, which you got to take caution because of the seeds. They're basically not going to suck the juices out of it. It's going to be very bitter. Their taste buds aren't developing. The other one is going to suck all the juices out of that little piece of citrus uh, because it's safe, because of very few to no seeds, but it's very tasty and sweet, sugary uh, substance. So for kids, I like to call this a kid-friendly citrus as well. So we know citrus in general, including these Satsuma mandarin oranges, besides referring to vitamin C occasionally, they're delicious, they're healthy for you. And of course, like we described with the little ones, they're very fun to eat and easy to peel and eat as well. High quality fruit is what we're looking for for the home gardener and even the small acre producers that might have that entrepreneurial spirit with the farmer's market of growing some of these and bringing them in during the seasons when they're, when they're ready to be harvested. Satsuma mandarin oranges are high yielding and somewhat of a low input crop. We can categorize these possibly as an earth kind friendly crop in the extension horticulture program of Texas A&M University. So not too much spraying, not too much issues with insects or disease as well. We have archived on my Extension 210 YouTube channel, Molly Keck, our entomologist, uh, did a, a pest part of the citrus talk. So if you get an opportunity, you might visit that for certain insects that sometimes get on, on citrus in general. So not only being a high yielding and low input crop, uh, the fruit of Satsuma mandarin oranges start coming in around late October uh, through January. Of course, January is typically the coldest month of the year for in and around the San Antonio area. And the, the cooler weather of fall time typically starts around mid-September. Our first frost date is typically around mid-November. If you look at this picture towards the middle, 
Uh, it's a light colored fruit, but the, the more mature, the more maturated the fruit gets, the colder it gets. As you see the fruit to the left and bottom left and right has a much, much more brilliant color to it. That means the sugar content is much, much more extreme. And um, so if you go out there early in the morning when it's kind of cold and you clip one of these trees off the off these uh, Satsuma mandarins, oh, what a treat to start your morning. They get big. You know, an average size of an Eva house is eight to 10 feet or so tall. This tree right there with all those abundant fruit on it, very old, majestic tree right there. I think that's one of the original trees um, that Dr. Parsons planted next to his residence. It is a good 14 feet tall. So we want to keep you guys off these ladders. You know, be it a fig, a pomegranate, a peach tree, a plum. You know, if we can train them and keep these trees eight feet, no larger than 10 or 12 feet, it's going to be much, much uh, easier for you. So we'll talk towards the end and doing some light pruning on these if they get a little bit too big because we don't want you on ladders and ideally we don't want you on the roofs of these trees like Dr. Larry Stein is because that's not good for your health uh, if your spouse doesn't hold that ladder correctly or she runs inside it's real hard to get off that ladder there plus we don't want to just be harvesting the low-hanging fruit because the birds and the other creature creatures will get to the top eat the top and do their business on the fruit that you harvest on the bottom if you notice on this picture dr larry stein in his right hand has a pair of very sharp hand clippers so satsuma mandarin oranges need to be clipped individually cut from the tree if you just grab a fruit like a navel orange, it comes off pretty easy after you turn it a couple times. But if you just grab a fruit of Satsuma mandarin orange, these Christmas oranges, um, they rip. So the skin comes with the tip of that uh, stem of that fruit attachment. So that means you're going to have to consume them, juice them, or freeze them. So those fruit that we see at the grocery store like the little cuties, the little sweeties, and things like that. Those are been bred even smaller uh, for a bite-sized lunch meals for the little ones at lunchtime. And that's another labor intensity that we have is clipping them commercially off these trees. So again, as we mentioned, all citrus trees, besides Satsuma mandarin oranges, should be grown as bushes, okay? Should be grown as bushes a big bush and we can see um, they're tropical they're evergreen tropical and evergreen and the biggest mistake people make on very very young trees both on the patio and establishing them in the landscape particularly trees that are five years or younger is we get overly excited on all fruit trees in general the citrus peaches plums and other once the tree gets fruit on it, we need to thin them. And we don't want to put unneeded stress on these young developing trees. As a rule of thumb for most all fruiting trees, you should have one fruit per every fruiting stem, no more than two, ideally spaced out every six inches apart. If you do not do that, what, we, what are we seeing in this slide here? We see much much weight on these limbs that are probably going to snap we're probably going to have uh, the quality of the sugar is going to be less in the fruit and we're not going to have a, a tree that's going to fruit that much if at all the following year because we overcropped it we overcropped it so ideally when they're marble size or no larger than golf ball size and i know it's hard for you guys and gals as home owners to do this, but you really need to take these fruit off so we're not putting unnecessary stress. So overcropping, I had a ton of fruit on my tree last year, but very, very little fruit on it this year because you overcropped it. The tree has to get it back into a, uh, uh, a rejuvenation state from uh, back into reproduction over just growth state in general. So don't overcrop your trees, grow them as big multi-trunk bushes. This is a good man, a gentleman's gentleman, 
And if you look at Webster's Dictionary, they should have put uh, under the word gentleman, Mr. Malcolm Beck. Another great mentor of mine, a great friend, a great teacher, one of the best citizen scientists that I have ever known. Malcolm Beck was way before his time. He worked many days on the railroad for many years. Him and his wife, Delphine, started a wonderful organic vegetable uh, garden that they sell produce out of. And then he decided to make compost and make more money selling the compost. So without any government aid, he was reduce, reuse, and recycle at its best. And he started with the entrepreneurial spirit of Gardenville, which is a huge company uh, selling organic compost, soils, and mulches. So he used to charge people, municipalities, landscapers to drop material at his site, dumping fees. Then he would blend the best mulches and compost and things like that, and then sell them back to us without any government aid and a true entrepreneur. Every time you would go out and visit Malcolm Beck here at his residence at the San Antonio location, he always had a friendly smile, always tried to teach you something new, but most importantly, that tree behind Mr. Beck, he would give you a little baby tree because that was his favorite tree. And that's called a Changsha tangerine, Changsha tangerine. Now, Changsha tangerine uh, is the most cold hardiest citrus we can grow here. It's a little bit hard to find. And then notice it looks very similar to a Satsuma mandarin. Remember, Satsuma mandarin is not a true orange and it's not a tangerine. Changsha tangerine is a, a true tangerine, but it and tastes very good, very sweet, but it has a ton of seeds in it. Ton of seeds in it and it is very cold hardy. So Dr. Parsons basically went to Dr. Moy at the Botanical Garden after he got the Satsuma Mandarin Orange project going and the selection of Niho and Sito of that selections that they originally brought in out of Japan 20 years later, it takes many years to do this. The picture to the left is Changsha Tangerine, with seeds, the most cold hardiness of all citrus. The picture to the right, excuse me, to the, the picture in the middle is breeding lines of the original Satsuma mandarin oranges that uh, Dr. Moy had with his breeding line. So he crossed, the only cross in the world with Changsha tangerine with specific Satsuma mandarin orange heritage lineage and the far right came up with a new superior Chang, uh, Changsha tangerine cross with Satsuma mandarin orange with one seed right there but almost seedless and that came up with the twoest of the newest Texas superstar releases called orange and arctic frost so that gives us much more cold hardiness Miho and Sito already have some good cold hardiness, but with the orange and arctic frost with Changsha tangerine bred into it, gives it even more cold hardiness. So this became another million dollar plant for our great state of Texas with the Extinction Horticulture Program helping with this, of course, and research, and came up with orange and arctic frost. Now, I really don't like these two names because it sounds like we can grow these in a very very cold area like alaska so the grower decided to name them after they purchased these original plants from the san antonio botanical garden for the far left is dr larry stein then then mr moy and then three fellows in the middle and right are greenleaf nursery representatives so they're the ones that got the ball rolling on dr moy's arctic and orange frost and they no longer grow it and the grower that's growing these with Miho, Sito, and other citrus, the biggest in the state, is Sac Saxon, Becknell, and Sun. So we're great that that is growing and going out there to memorize, uh, to to give honor to Dr. Moy for really breeding this, the only uh, breeding program in the world to do something like this. Unbelievable what he did here. 
They're very tasty, both of these. Good sugar to acid ratio. A little bit more cold hardiness, but I really don't like the names of them because they do have some cold tolerance, but not in Alaska. So that's a little bit about the Satsuma Mandarin oranges and a little bit of history, which is so beautiful coming out of our backyard here in San Antonio. So limes would be the opposite of orange and Arctic frost and Miho and Sito. Satsuma Mandarin oranges that have a little bit more cold hardiness and Changsha Tangerine having the best cold hardiness, but limes are opposite. Limes are very cold sensitive. Most citrus blooms in January, the coldest month of the year, through early March. Limes will give you about two bloom sets and possibly two yields of fruit uh, per year if you're lucky. But we should really grow limes in containers on the patio and protect them uh, during the cold winter time. So the lime to the left is what we refer to as Persian lime, a much larger fruit to it, a little bit more acidity. Uh, to the fruit compared to the one on the right, which is key lime. Uh, key lime is really a, a better grown here for abundance of fruit, a better, I think, a better a taste to it. A key lime is what in Florida they make key lime pie. But key lime is also colloquial, what we call Mexican limes. So um, it goes by many, many names. If you look at the one on the right, that's a marketable fruit that we use, we're accustomed to purchasing at the produce section at the grocery store. So key lime, Mexican lime, one and the same. The one on the left is a lime. And down in the valley, our Rio Grande Valley, they call these limes valley lemons, valley lemons, because they keep them on the tree till about the time they're ready to drop off the tree when they're fully maturated, mature, as we see on the, on the left here, yellow. So that's more intense flavoring to it and different than to the right uh, picture. So that's what they call them is Valley Lemons, which is really a lime. The old timers and a lot of people in the valley start these from seed. Remember, seed from a citrus stays true to type. It just takes it many years, typically five to eight years, uh, to go through juvenility into production. That's why grafting is so important. But a lot of people still sell and grow lime trees started truly from seed because unlike most other citrus started from seed, you can come into production much, much earlier. Typically year three is when fruit comes. So they pretty, if you keep them well watered, and well uh, fertilized, they grow pretty, pretty quick there. That's a little bit about limes there. The most popular citrus sold in the U.S. is the improved Myers lemon. Improved Myers lemon. Most of the time when you buy, it, uh, it's going to be tagged Myers lemon because all the newer selections of Myers lemon that have been improved have resistance to an old, old virus called Trezetsia. That was devastating citrus many, many moons ago, particularly in California. Myers lemon is not a true lemon. It's possibly a cross of a sweet orange tree, and, uh, but it is the most popular citrus sold in the U.S. as a uh, container a plant on the patio. The lemons that you typically buy at the grocery store come out of California which has a unique nipple on the tip of the fruit. And those are typically called Eureka lemons, which is a true lemon. Myers lemon has a much, much sweeter taste, not as tart as the Eureka lemons. Uh, they do best in containers, but there are a few uh, folks uh, in microclimates in well-protected location that can grow these as a yard tree as well in the landscape. Uh, lemons have unique uh, characteristics besides the white flower when it's completely open. The tip of the bud of the flower before it opens has a touch and a unique purple on it uh, as well. That helps uh, uh, show the difference of uh, lemons, particularly uh, Myers lemon, compared to other citrus. 
There is grapefruit. Of course, we know where the world's greatest grapefruit comes. And the world comes from our Rio Grande Valley with the real red, Texas red, and all the beautiful grapefruit that we can buy as Christmas gifts and from late October to, to typically up to early March at our favorite market. And of course, are dark colored ones with the red color typically, real red and all those. Uh, this one is called Bloom Sweet, which makes a pretty good one on the patio. And I've seen some beautiful landscapes. It's the old standard yellow white type grapefruit this selection came as a ge genetic mutation off a sport a cutting off a off a real red grapefruit in houston and it looks like it has much more winter hardiness of all the grapefruit so this is a very popular one uh, we can grow them on the patio of course grapefruit a uh, pretty nice size fruit on it uh, but you can also put it in the landscape of all the citrus this is probably the tallest growing one Real hard to keep this eight to ten feet tall unless you keep it as a semi dwarf uh, in a container or on the patio or kind of trim back accordingly to keep it to the eight to ten. But most of these get up twelve feet plus, so it might be hard if you really truly have a, a special location that's protected during the cold winter time as a landscape tree. These blood oranges, uh, which come from North Africa and Sicily. Or what they call cinquine blood orange, cinquine sangre, cinquini blood oranges. And these are becoming very popular, very new to our market. So I think we should, for now, really, if we can find these like Moro and some of these older selections, is keep them as a um, patio tree uh, and really think it out if we do want this as a yard tree. It's real, real hard because most of us have very uniquely. Uh, warm nighttime temperatures during the summer months so it's real hard to color up that redness inside that fruit because of the nighttime temperatures but the ones i've been seeing the last few years of people that have been growing them have had pretty good success very tasty fruit and very uniquely uh, colorful in them as well i like to talk about these uh, little oranges i always call kumquats uh, little oranges with, with attitudes because the skin is uh, edible, uh, very sweet, but then you get inside and the fruit are very tart. Nagami is a teardrop type. Uh, the one on the left, the Miwa, has a round fruit. Uh, very beautiful uh, when they're in bloom. Excellent as a patio tree. Uh, they do have some pretty good winter cold tolerance um, to them. The fruit is also used in marmalades and jams and for uh, mixed drinks and things like that uh, as well. So we talked about some of the main citrus that people have fun with and should be growing. The Setsuma mandarin oranges for sure. Miho and Sito, orange frost and arctic frost. All the newer ones out of the botanical garden with Dr. Moy. Talked about limes, particularly the key lime, the Mexican lime. Uh, the thornless ones are much easier to get and probably easier to work with than the thorny ones. And of course, lemons, particularly the Myers lemon, a little bit about grapefruit, and then of course the kumquats. But there's so many different types of citrus that you might want to play with and see how you grow. Regardless, for sure, for sure, like in this image, the container in the middle is what you purchased. A 10-inch diameter, a number five container. You need to grow all citrus for at least the first three years in containers. So do not buy one of these orange frosts in October and plant it in the ground in November. And we have a uniquely cold spell in December, January, it dies and you say it's not winter hardy. So if you really have a game plan to plant a citrus tree in the landscape, you have to plant it minimum three years after you size up and upgrade it into these larger size containers for hardened off wood, more leaf mass, a well-defined root system, and a good, strong, healthy tree. Once we plant these trees in the yard, the time frame ideally is the month of April, May, and early June, but three years. You can keep them in these containers and grow them as pseudo bonsai type trees in containers for many, many years. 
So the key on these containers is follow the patio citrus guidelines that we have on the Aggie Horticulture or PlantAnswers.com website, which will give you more in-depth details. Remember when you're growing vegetables or fruits, the key is sunlight. You need plenty of sunlight for vegetables and fruit, ample air circulation, ample weed management, good watering practices, but nutrition. We're growing leaves. Leaves, vibrant, healthy, green, abundant, with sunlight, with photosynthesis. So container trees should be fertilized three times a year, early March, early June, and early September. Three times a year, early March, early June, early September. With copious amounts of a slow-release container fertilizer, such as Osmocote or something similar to that, means lace these things. And during the spring and early summer season when they're actively in growth stage, you can supplement once a week, particularly these container trees, with a water-soluble fertilizer uh, so we keep it growing, growing, growing. Always have a contingency when it's super, super cold, how we're going to move these trees, how we're going to protect them. Some people put them on rollers or casters. And, of course, any plant that's in a container, if you have a base or a saucer on the bottom, never let that water stagnate, not only for the uh, mosquito situation of the wigglers, but also that's where the weep holes that oxygen is taken in by their feeder roots, you don't want them to rot out on there uh, as well. So that's a little bit about patio. Remember three years plus before you plant it as a yard tree, upgrade, upgrade. And when you upgrade, it's just like you and I, when we're little boys and girls, we don't go from size, whatever size shoe or pant to uh, an adult size, we, we gradually move up. Plants are the same way, we step them up step them up into the next couple sizes larger gently tap the container remove it from the container do not disturb that root system if the roots are very entwined or girdled loosen them up a little bit loosen them up a little bit and then use a premium peat-based potting mix not potting soil a peat-based potting mix 80 percent cut that with 20 percent of a finished compost and then if you keep these trees in containers of five years or more on that patio citrus write-up that we have both on Aggie Horticulture and PlantAnswers.com, it will kind of show you how to do root pruning, rejuvenating, pruning it uh, to keep it as a pseudo bonsai small tree uh, on the patio. And look at these trees as we talked about overcropping and thinning fruits. One fruit should equal 45 leaves. One fruit equals 45 leaves. So we have good spacing of these fruit on these two trees, the one to the left and one to the right, and less stress on the tree, but we're gonna have some fruit that we can enjoy as a family uh, for the Christmas holiday season. There's a well-established big tree, old tree in the landscape. So that's the big tree. That's a good 10 feet tall and 10 to 12 feet wide, abundance of fruit on it and so watering is very important as a rule of thumb for fruiting trees from start to end you need an inch of water if you want to finish that fruit per week up to an inch of water per week citrus are very very drought tolerant if we ever have the water turned off uh, citrus will survive particularly if they're well established big trees but don't expect fruit and don't expect quality fruit with good sugar content uh, start to end an inch a week in lieu of significant rainfall so if we have rainfall during that time frame you just you're watering and when we mean water that's the drip line of the tree the outskirts of the branches is where most of those roots are going to be a little bit there and out and then you can kind of inside the canopy a little bit but main water goes at the drip line fertilizing yard trees uh, do it the same time frame as containers early march early june and early september use a different fertilizer use a granulated fertilizer 1959 1959 the same fertilizer you use for your vegetable garden as pre-plant fertilizer, both in spring and fall, 
And the same fertilizer most of us use around mid-April, early May for our lawns. Use one pound for every three feet of hive, since we grow citrus as big bushes, one pound per every three feet of hive. And that's um, watered in real well after you apply it. Immediately seal that bag of fertilizer and store it away. We need leaves, we need green leaves in order to have fruit as well. So citrus overall, they're not only beautiful trees, shiny tropical like leaves to them, but they're amazingly fragrant, very fragrant. You can smell the flowers from, from quite some distance. You do not need bees to pollinate citrus. And especially citrus like the little sweeties and cuties uh, that are at the um, grocery store that are Satsuma mandarins bred to be even smaller. Those, those groves in California, they do not want surrounding types of crops that use bees to pollinate their crops because they want to keep these trees as seedless, as seedless and as small fruit as possible so it's easy for the little ones to peel them and have a nice treat for lunchtime or a snack after school. So you don't need bees to pollinate because they're self-fertile as citrus trees. But in other types like navel orange groves and even down in the valley where the grapefruit are, uh, they sometimes they make a little bit add value cash flow by letting honey uh, honey hives come in. So when the citrus are blooming, some of the best honey in the world is citrus blossom honey. Unbelievable. Very, very sweet. I still think the best honey, even better than this, comes from uh, a South Texas brush country. Uvalde used to be one of the biggest uh, honey producers in the nation at one time. Is Wahio, Wahia, Wahio honey, which is South Texas white brush. And that's some of the best, I think, in the world. So overall, there's not too many issues with citrus. And again, if you go to my Extension 210 YouTube channel, Molly Keck, our entomologist, has some of the insect challenges uh, that citrus tends to have. But let's, let's talk about a couple other challenges here. So big yard trees and trees in containers, if you didn't move it or properly wrap them and protect them during the wintertime, being a tropical type of a fruit might have winter kill on it. Okay, the key on these grafted trees is always know where that graft is. So when you plant it as a yard tree and we gently take it out of that container, examine that root system before we plant it, loosen up that root system, open up that root system, maybe even make an, uh, an eighth of an inch X on both sides of that root ball so that water can get into that root system. We plant them an inch above grade. We never plant trees uh, below or excess soil mulch on those crowns. We tend to overplant shade and fruit trees too deep, and then we have a lot of suckering. That sour orange rootstock of most of these citrus is very aggressive rootstock. So they shoot straight up. They shoot straight up, right? Big leaves, big thorns. And we want to get those out. So you see some trees, even fruit as late as April and May. Uh, with still orange oranges on them and, and that's the rootstock that has taken over the tree either from winter damage or winter kill or stress of some type of like drought or other or poor maintenance so we only do pruning from winter damage or if we need to bring down the tree because it got too tall like the roof line that we showed earlier when new growth starts pushing out in the springtime we take out dead wood and we take out when we need to bring it down to a manageable hive. Remember, pruning is a dwarfing and rejuvenation process. So deadwood for sure always needs to be removed when new growth pushes out. And if a tree is 12 feet, we only take out no more than a third of the total leaf mass out at any given time. So if the tree is 12 foot, and we really want it about eight, nine feet, 10 feet. We take out three feet at the most, and then we can take some more out the following year and keep it to that manageable height. And we don't hedge citrus. We do not hedge citrus as a bush. We look for that tallest branch, and we 
find where it's connected to another branch and we cut it off completely. And that's proper pruning for both winter kill, winter damage, and keeping it to manageable hive uh, for harvesting and spraying purposes. Another issue that we sometimes get on citrus, sometimes we see this on blackberries, particularly um, in apples, if you're trying to grow apples, which is very hard, uh, sometimes on peaches and quite a bit on ornamental plants. Our parent material down the central and south Texas 35 corridor is limestone. That's our parent material. So the vast majority of us have very high pH, severely buffer clay calcareous type soils. So new growth appears with the veins of the new growth green, the outskirts yellow, and typically the burn on the leaf margin, and that's called intervenal chlorosis, intervenal chlorosis. So we try to build the soil when we mulch, 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 always keep it mulch on those yard trees, uh, 10 feet out, 10 feet out, no grass, no competition, no weeds, no little petunias or nothing like that. A two, 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 twice a year, May, early September, we put two inches of a double shredded hardwood mulch, maybe a living mulch that has compost, a minimum of two inches away from the crown. Remember, we never put excess soil or crown up to the base of a plant. That might minimize that. Plus, it helps hold the weeds in, the watering in, keeps the weeds out, I'm sorry, keeps the water in, it's aesthetically pleasing. And we don't have a lot of organic material in our soil, so that helps build. Another great lesson Malcolm Beck taught us, 106 degrees out there during August, put a soil thermometer underneath that mulch layer, hey, 80 degrees, mulch, mulch, mulch. If you have to spray, remember plants, take nutrition and water through their feeder roots. Uh, the only exception is basically zinc on pecan trees sprayed at the leaves and a chelated iron on the early stage before it gets too bad on the new leaves of these plants. EDDHA is the best of the best chelated irons out there. There's others that are not as expensive, but look at the active ingredient. Water the plant real good in the morning or the day before. Make an exception to water the leaves of the plant. Early in the morning, spray this iron or drench the leaves and the roots because the iron, chelate means claw. The iron is clawed into the surface of the leaf and it should green it up after the second or third application in one week intervals. So I hope you all had a little bit fun with citrus. It's one of the easiest and funnest crops to grow and very nutritious besides vitamin C, fiber, and other benefits of we, that we have. So if you're growing some citrus, maybe we gave you some tips to improve those growing techniques, or maybe you're ready for that special occasion of Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthday, or other, to share that a gift, a great gardening gift idea, to share that unique Satsuma mandarin orange, lemon or lime, or maybe one of each for that special gardener in your life. I always like to end my presentations with a bonus plant. Today's bonus plant is a plant we plant during the month of May, early June. It's a seasonal annual. It was designated as a Texas superstar plant a few years back. It's a Vinca periwinkle. But the series we want y'all to plant is Cora. And you can see that they come in an array of different colors. An annual that loves the sun, particularly when it's in July and August. The newest selections and a few extra colors added to the Coravinca series is XDR, extra disease resistance. They stand alone as a border plant in and around your landscape or a border of your garden, in a hanging basket or a beautiful container on the patio. They love the sun. A great addition to add that color during the hot summer months when they're in full bloom. We mentioned Aggie Horticulture and PlantAnswers.com. Please utilize those two websites, not only to look up Dr. Moy on PlantAnswers.com, but to study up more on fruit and citrus trees, both on Aggie Horticulture on the fruit tree section and PlantAnswers.com, but the patio citrus 
brochure to give you more review of growing citrus on the patio and landscape and more history of the citrus program with extension of horticulture for our great state of Texas. Don't forget our Bear County Extension Service website and our Facebook page. Friend us, like us, and go to that to see all the ongoing educational opportunities that the extension staff offers here locally in Bear County. Please subscribe to our My Extension 210 YouTube channel. Uh, large M, Large E, My Extension 210, one word, YouTube channel. This is should be archived there. Molly Keck's entomology part of the insects that go to citrus and many other seasonal topics related to gardening and landscape. I hope you had fun, learned a little bit. Always have fun out there. Get the kids along, involved in the gardening experience and happy gardening everyone.